Let's go back in time. Let's go to an airport. Doesn't matter which one. What matters is that we turn back the calendar about 35 years. People are dressed a little differently than they are nowadays, and they don't have cell phones. But there is another thing that immediately catches your eye. The passengers are struggling and sweating as they are dragging heavy suitcases with them. There's a reason why. Trolleys haven't been invented yet, and suitcases must be hefted along everywhere. I picture seeing a man, a Northwest Airlines pilot, watching these passengers complaining about the weight of their luggage. Or, more likely, the man is thinking of those who, like him, work in aviation and need to take a plane very often. Suitcases are an obstacle, and traveling without all that weight would be much more pleasant. Maybe, as a result of thoughts like these, Robert Plath, that's the man's name, has an idea. Why not put wheels under suitcases? Just like that. It's 1987, and to be fair, someone had already thought of a similar solution. Plath, however, was the first person to build the trolley as we know it, with wheels on the bottom side, the extendable handle, and most importantly, he was the first to put this invention on the market. Plath's colleagues immediately showed great interest in this new suitcase and began using trolleys on their trips. It didn't take long before other travelers also noticed this new way of carrying suitcases. And naturally, trolleys were soon used all over the world. If you've watched This Must Be The Place, the movie by the Italian director Paolo Sorrentino, you will probably remember the dialogue that takes place between Sean Penn and a gentleman unknown to him. The man tells Sean Penn the story of the birth of the trolley and concludes by saying, Every day I ask myself the same question. Why anyone didn't think about it sooner? Then Sean Penn, somewhat taken aback, asks him why he's asking himself this question every day. And the gentleman replies, Because... I'm that someone who had the bright idea. And he introduces himself by saying that he is Robert Plath. You see, sometimes revolutions are born that way, thanks to someone who has a very simple idea, so simple that it seems impossible that no one has ever thought of it before. I'm Rosita Martini. And this is Tuned, a podcast that tells the stories, paths, and work done by today's innovators to create the solutions of the future. Tuned is a podcast promoted by Aeroporti di Roma and produced by Cora Media. I was uh, born and raised in a uh, town up north in the Netherlands, uh, a city called Den Helder, which is uh, famous to be a navy town. The voice you are hearing is that of Marlon van der Meer. Marlon also had a simple intuition that came with an equally obvious question. How is it possible that we still use paper luggage tags today at the airport? We waste a lot of paper for something that perhaps could be digitized. And so, based on this question, he started working on a project. Yet, I won't anticipate anything, because first, I want to get to know Marlon better. When he was very young, as is often the case with people born in very small towns, Marlon dreamed of moving to a big city. When you're a youngster, uh, first thing you want to do is go to Amsterdam. That's exactly what I did. So when I finished high school, I went uh, to study in Amsterdam, uh, communicational science. And uh, yeah, I stayed in Amsterdam for until I was 22, 23. And now I live in a suburb around Amsterdam. There is one thing. One gift that Marlon received when he was just 12 years old that changed his life forever. A computer. Today, we all have at least one in our homes, but in the mid-80s, it was anything but common. I was born in 73, and I received my first computer in 85. And uh, basically, uh, my mom, she was a teacher on a, on a high school. She said, well, uh, if you want to do something, computers will be the next thing. And my father was the complete opposite of that, uh, and he didn't believe in it. So my mom 
she arranged me at that time a very expensive Tandy TRS-80, which was by then a computer with floppy drives. It, it, it was literally, an, it, it has nothing to do with the computers we have today. But I was fascinated by the thing. And uh, that fascination turned out me starting programming on the thing. And it really couldn't do a lot of things, but um, I figured out a lot. And two years later, I, I bought my first uh, smaller computers. And then, uh, yeah, computers uh, was a part of my life. I tried to picture Marlon as a teenager. Maybe he was one of those kids who spent entire days in front of the computer, seemingly motionless for hours, but actually engaged in discovering new worlds. And, as a matter of fact, Marlon cannot scold his son too much these days. I have a 14-year-old, and um, he is using his PlayStation all the time, his iPhone all the time, and it's hard for me as a dad now to say, Hey, go play outside, play uh, with your friends outside. It, it's a really bad discussion. But now, let's jump forward in time. We're in the 90s. Marlon is no longer a teenager, but a young adult. As we said, he went to Amsterdam to study communication, but at some point he decided to change his career path. He didn't finish college and found a job instead. I didn't finish my university, that's important to understand. I was hired by a company called KPN, uh, KPN Mobile, which is the, the mobile uh, network in the, in the Netherlands. Besides my fascination for computers, uh, mobile caught my early attention. Yeah, basically, they all always hire talent from universities. And at that time, uh, early 90s, 93, 94, mobile technology was in an early stage. It was only about mobile calling. Nobody was talking about mobile data, set aside text messaging. But me being one of the, yeah, so to say, stupidest kids in the, cl in the classroom, I was the last one that was chosen when yeah, basically they, they said, well, this person is uh, responsible for this product group voice. It's generating so much cash, so uh, we need high talent on that. And I was actually the last one. So I ended up with a phenomenon called text messaging. But the stupidity was, uh, they also aligned my salary with uh, uh, text messaging. And I don't have to explain, most of you know what an, what an explosion it was with, uh, with text messaging. Everybody was using text messaging. And I did that for, um, I was responsible, didn't give it away uh, until 2001. Today, phone texting seems like prehistoric stuff. I know. But anyone who's 35 years old and up remembers them well. Receiving a text message was a real thrill. In the early days, there wasn't even the autocorrect, and in order to type sentences, it was necessary to press a number key several times. The first text message in history was sent in December 92, and it contained a simple Merry Christmas. I read somewhere that, in the beginning, this innovation did not generate particular interest. People were used to hearing each other's voices, and it was unclear to many why they should text instead of making a phone call. Within a few years, however, text messages experienced a real boom. Everyone started using them, and so Marlon definitely found himself in the right place at the right time. Anyway, he then decided to start his own company in 2001. I founded my own company with money from the mobile operator for um, basically text to TV. Uh, I saw the relationship between mobile messaging and, and, and television programs. So today, uh, voting or, uh, on TV shows, it was a big business. So we built a uh, uh, worldwide infrastructure and we started uh, with the Eurovision Song Festival in 2000. We allowed viewers to um, to send a text, to participate, and uh, later on also text messages appeared on screen, which we did on music stations. And uh, the music stations uh, from MTV Network were basically using it all over the world, uh, building us an infrastructure to facilitate that. That was my first startup, and I did that until 2011, 2012, so it continued for almost 12 years. We started this episode by talking about Robert Plath, and the invention of the trolley, and ended up talking about text messages, mobile phones, MTV. 
Yet, in reality, the real stars of this episode are suitcases, the biggest source of stress for travelers. How many times have you asked yourselves, where will my suitcase be? Will it arrive on time? What if it gets lost? As I said earlier, Marlon has founded a new startup that does just that. His bags ID has been selected to participate in Runway to the Future, the accelerator program developed by Aeroporti di Roma and taking place at Fiumicino Airport's Innovation Hub, the first startup's incubator built inside an airport in Italy. Bags ID brings a new approach to airport luggage shipping. But how does it work? If you travel right now, passenger biometrics is the standard. You don't have to show your passport anymore. It's just a camera who recognizes your face. And based on that, you're allowed to go through customs and go to what we call airside on an airport. We applied that same technology on baggage. So the phenomenon was, could we recognize a bag based on biometrical and unique identification points of a bag? Why would you do that? Uh, now, basically, if you look at an airport, everything we do today is very simply with passenger biometrics, but still you need to drop off your bag, you need to weigh your bag, and you need to put a paper a tag around it. And uh, now, what can you do with that? If you have more data of, of a bag, of an object, besides recognizing it, that data will put you in a position to develop new services and tools and that makes it m way easier uh, for passengers to travel with bags. But also, airports and airlines can solve today's problems uh, yeah, with, with, with that data. One example I can give you, Let's say a, a, a bag um, is, uh, you need to put a tag around it, and that barcode tag is read by the system. But what if that bag is not, or that, that uh, label is cut off, so it, you cannot recognize it anymore? Where is that bag going then? The first thing to do to set up such a system is to create a large database from which to start. Marlon explains that this is a similar principle to apps that recognize songs, for instance. You let the app hear a song, it searches its archive, which contains millions of songs, recognizes it, and tells you what the title is. But how can this principle be applied to luggage? Well, first of all, you definitely need a lot of creativity. We created a data set specifically for baggage, uh, because in the domain of baggage there were so many problems. And in the beginning, of course, it was pure theory because I didn't know if we were capable of building such a platform. That was the first thing. And to build a prototype, you still need to have a data set. It's a funny story, actually, how we got on the data set because every bag is being photographed uh, on an airport. But from the inside, it's called an X-ray system, uh, but not from the outside. So how do you get on earth an, an, a database with images of used bags? So we started to look at sites like eBay or the local equivalent uh, from eBay. And that images that were on that uh, sites were not good enough. So we basically ended up buying the bags and photographed them 360 degrees. So I believe we had more than uh, 1,500 bags that we bought on the local equivalent of, uh, of eBay. And with a couple of students, we, we took a lot of images see if we could recognize it. In, in some cases, we made more than a thousand images of a bag uh, on every unique bag. So traveling around and go to people's houses and, and, and uh, buy their old bags, that, that was a fascinating uh, moment in our journey. And uh, yeah, today, uh, yeah, we have uh, hundreds of, no, not hundreds of millions, tens of millions of uh, baggage profiles and all captured at airports. So the database is slightly bigger now, yeah. There are many ways to fight for a more sustainable world. Like, for instance, paying attention to things that seem small, but may not be so small. Luggage tags are a great example. Honestly, I had never thought about the fact that all those labels create waste that could be avoided. Marlon, on the other hand, made that point clearly. We are going to go for a completely paperless flight. You need to realize 
that we are uh, using 50 million kilos of barcode tax annually. That's the equivalent of eight square kilometers forest that's being killed to, to produce the paper only. Worldwide, we are using 125,000 barcode printers, which are permanently attached to the, to the grid, to the power grid. Why do we still do that? And if we are talking about a sustainable aviation, baggage needs to be on the agenda. And that's exactly what we are doing with Bags ID. When it comes to startups, it's sometimes easy to fall into the cliche of the lone genius entrepreneur. The one who has a vision before everyone else and manages to change the world through an incredible invention. Well, it is certainly true that there have been and are men and women who have changed the world with a single idea. But it is also true that there is always the work of many people behind it. Because at one point, that idea has to be put into practice. It has to be made concrete. And during this process, you face problems, obstacles. In short, working as a team definitely gives you an edge. I'm very proud of our startup. Basically a lot of things actually, which makes me a proud man. Uh, for most my team, it's incredible what they have achieved over the last period of time, uh, how they dealt with complex issues how they worked around uh, yeah, processes, how they worked together. Uh, really, really impressed by, by that. And uh, it inspires me every day on how these people are, are doing that. So my team is uh, basically yeah, the, the main pillar of Bags ID. Entrepreneurship, the solo entrepreneur, yeah, it's basically a myth. They don't exist. So if you talk to me, you're talking to a whole team. There is a question that keeps coming up in all the episodes of this podcast. We ask all the startuppers to tell us what invention they are a bit envious of, what they would have liked to come up with themselves. I was very curious about Marlon's answer. Some applications uh, like Siri are, and, and, and speech recognition, uh, that's the basic for so many things that we didn't even scratch the surface on. And Siri, in some extent, comes also to my domain. Uh, I'm, I'm waiting for the Apple uh, glasses. And that's something I would love to be part of. Having a, a glass, I'm, I'm using glasses, but it's not giving me any other information than it sharpens my sight. And I would love to, to do that, but again, it's in my domain of vision. I experimented a little bit with the early versions, but I'm looking forward to, um, to the next versions. And for 100%, uh, Bags ID will be working with glasses as well. There is a Roman Polanski movie released in 1988 called Frantic that is based on a simple misunderstanding. Harrison Ford plays a surgeon who goes on vacation with his wife to Paris. When the couple arrives at the hotel, however, his wife Sandra fails to open her suitcase. It is clear that there has been a mix-up at the airport, so Harrison Ford calls the airline and it seems that everything will be resolved easily, like a minor hassle. In reality, however, that suitcase mix-up kicks off a series of intricate events, triggering kidnappings and various mysteries. In reality, most of the time, losing a suitcase just means not having your clothes for a few days. However, I believe that in the not-too-distant future, losing a suitcase during a plane trip will be considered an almost vintage thing, easily avoidable thanks to technology. Screenwriters will have one less narrative device to work with. We, travelers, however, will have far fewer things to worry about. Tuned is a podcast series written by Ilaria Orru, promoted by Aeroporti di Roma and produced by Cora Media. The live sound engineer is Daniel Van de Poppe, Studio recordings by Andrea Girelli. Post-production and sound design by Davide De Benedetti for Filmico. Sound and music supervision by Andrea Girelli. Production Monia Donati. Text editing by Graziano Nani. Additional music is under license from Machiavelli Music and Universal Music Publishing Ricordi SRL. SRL.